All right, everybody, I am Dr. Jacob Lardson, and in this video, we're going to try and answer the question, what is standard written English? And as part of that, we're, uh, we're also going to be answering a couple other questions about how English works. So hopefully uh, we can get through this pretty quickly. All right, here we go. So what is standard written English? Um, standard written English is when you think of the rules of whether you write correct or wrong or something like that, you're thinking of standard written English. They are the commonly accepted rules and guidelines for writing the English language. Now, notice I'm talking about written language, not spoken language. They, um, we may act like they're the same thing, but they're not. They're really different. And even these rules, like any language, they change over time. So what is acceptable today may not have been acceptable in the past, and it's not necessarily what will be acceptable in the future. So things change, and that's okay, because our language changes. Okay, so this includes, when we're talking about standard written English, we're talking about grammar, we're talking about punctuation, we're talking about spelling, we're talking about capitalization, all the things you expect um, when you write, in general, standard written English. Now, if you're in a college setting, we might have some different expectations. What I'm referring to as academic writing, uh, it can also include other things like um, the style for how the paper is written, the tone that the paper is written in, the, the kind of the um, how formal you are or aren't. That's not the same as standard written English. That might be a layer on top of it based on when and for what situation you're writing for. So part of this, we also need to talk about dialects. Dialects are most prominent when we are speaking. So if you go to different places in the country, um, based on someone's different <clears throat> socioeconomic uh, demographics or, or even their culture, they may have different words. They may have different phrases. They may pronounce things differently. That isn't as prominent in written English unless we write like we talk, which a lot of people do, especially new writers. Um, but in the college setting where I teach, um, we're probably trying to stick, stay away from really informal writing where a dialect might be most prominent. And, uh, and hopefully, um, you know, we're still able to be clear, but Dialects have nothing to do with whether something is correct or not. It's just kind of the, the unique version of English in that community, in that area, in that group or whatever. And many people know how to switch back and forth between different uh, groups. So, you know, when you're at home, you might speak and write differently than when you're in a class. So it's, it's important that we can kind of switch back and forth. <clears throat> now, if your question is, well, do I have to follow it? Well, that's up to you, right? Sometimes people will judge you based on how well you write. If you make mistakes or depending on how you talk, they're going to judge you. And, and that's not cool. That's not fair. But that is what people do. What I want for my students, what I want for you watching this video is to have the ability to switch back and forth and to represent yourself the way that you want to be uh, represented. So, you know, do you have the ability to write standard written English? Uh, great, you can choose to use it or choose not to. But if you haven't practiced that skill, it's not a choice yet. Does that make sense? So we're going to go over it and then it's up to you when and where you're going to use it. Okay, so let's start with grammar. <clears throat> the way I like to define grammar is using the right words in the right order. Now, that's not to say that there are only certain words you can use, but the right kinds of words. And we'll get to that in a second. But in general, grammar is a language system for organizing words in a specified order. There is an order to how English works. Like any language, there are specific kinds of words. We call them parts of speech that serve different functions within the sentence and they work in certain orders and you mix them around. They don't always work in other orders. So 
that's important to uh, to recognize as well. Okay, so let's talk about some of these specifics. Um, yeah, so we brought up the uh, <clears throat> excuse me the eight parts of speech. Can you name them? If I told you noun was a part of speech, and now can you name them? Yeah. You can pause if you want to go through it, but no, I'm going to move ahead. Okay, so here we go. We have the eight parts of speech. We have nouns, pronouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, interjections. Now, depending on who you're talking to, they may say there's nine because they, they break up another part of speech out of adjectives that they call, oh, articles. I <laughs> spaced it. Articles. These are the words a, an, and the. They can fit under the definition of an adjective, uh, but sometimes people like to separate them out as their own thing. Anyway, so we've got eight. So what are they? Nouns. Well, they're the words that represent a person, place, thing, idea, or concept in a sentence. It's usually definition people are pretty quick to. Pronouns. Well, they're like nouns. Instead of having to repeat the name for that that noun over and over again, you can use a pronoun in its place. And that's that's basically what it is. A verb, people generally think that these are the actions. They're a little more than that. An action word is a verb, but it also can be an occurrence, something that happened, or it could be a state of being. Like if, I, if you ask me how I am, am is a state of being verb. All right, adjectives, these are the words that modify or describe nouns or pronouns. So if you want to say something about a person, place, thing, idea, or concept, you want to describe it, you're probably using an adjective. Adverbs are the words that modify basically any other part of the sentence, that it could be a verb, an adjective, another adverb, or it can be groups of words like a phrase or a clause. These are adverbs. They do a lot of things. Um, oftentimes they stand out because they might have an L-Y at the end of it, but not always. Okay, prepositions. These are words that show the relationship between nouns uh, and pronouns and other words in the sentence. Uh, typically, they'll start a phrase, you know, maybe three words long. That kind of sets up showing the relationship between different people, places, things, and ideas and concepts in a sentence. Conjunctions are the words that help to connect or separate uh, words, phrases, and clauses in a sentence. These are words like and, but, or conjunctions. And interjections. These don't actually serve a function in grammar. Like they don't hold a sentence together. They're just the word that we use to represent kind of those emotion words. They may be swear words, or they may be just like wow, or something like that. Words that don't, they're kind of their own thing outside of the structure of the sentence. We call it an interjection because it's interjecting into the sentence. So those are the parts of speech. Every single word in a sentence is performing a function as part of the structure, the building blocks for how a sentence works. Parts of speech are how we explain those functions that they're doing. Okay, so with that, we also have a couple terms to describe the bigger picture for what's happening in a sentence. And we call them the subject, the predicate, and as part of the predicate, we also need a complete thought. Those three concepts um, made up of parts of speech are necessary for a complete sentence. So when we're talking about grammar, we're only talking about what happens from the beginning to the end of a sentence because grammar doesn't extend beyond one sentence. It's only one sentence at a time. Now you can combine it into a paragraph, but that's not really about grammar anymore. That's just how it looks. Does that make sense? Grammar, the actual structure of the words and the kinds of words you're using, but it resets every time you have like a period or an exclamation point or a question mark. You with me so far? I hope so. Okay, so when I say using the right words, we're talking about word choice. When we, in you know, the parts of speech, when we say in the right order, we're talking about the structure of the sentence. So let's get into that structure 
a subject. Subject is the noun or the pronoun, or it could be more than one, that the sentence is about. It's going to show up early in the sentence, and the sentence is going to be describing something about that subject. So here's a, an example. The child played with Legos. The subject is the child, and played with Legos is our predicate. That predicate doesn't leave the reader hanging. It has completed the thought, so that's a complete sentence. Predicates are the group of words that begin with a verb, and they're going to describe something about what the subject is or what the subject is doing. Um, it all hinges around that verb. So when we talked about verbs before, we said that they could be an action word or they can describe like an occurrence, something that happened or happened is happening, or it could be a state of being, that's because that's what a predicate does. A predicate is that group of words that helps the verb do its job of describe something about what the subject is or is doing. You with me so far, hopefully. And this example, like we said, played with Legos is what the child is doing. That's the predicate. Now, you have to complete the thought of your sentence. And so here are some examples. What it might look like if you didn't complete a thought? So if I wrote the child played with, you'd be like, what they play with? Well, you didn't finish the thought. You can say the child played, and that could be the end of the sentence. We'd be like, okay, the child played. But once you say with, you're starting a new phrase, a new group of words. We call it a prepositional phrase and you need more to finish that thought that you started. So you need a complete thought. Another example, a child played with Legos in, in starts another group of words and we have to finish that thought. Those are just a couple examples. There are a number of different ways you can do it. Let's just uh, give you an idea for what I'm talking about. So those three things, subject, predicate, complete thought, that's what's necessary for a complete sentence. Other kinds of sentences are all going to build off of these building blocks, but they're going to start with those. Now, if we take this sentence, we can look at the function of what the job that each of these words in the sentence is doing. The is describing child. So it's an adjective because child is a noun. What is the child doing? It's playing. So we have the action verb, the action word played is a verb. It's describing that action that the child is doing. And then, like we said, we have the word with, which is a preposition, which is setting a phrase that's showing the relationship between the child and the Legos. What's it doing? What, what's it? Where are they? They're, it's playing with it. Does that, does that make sense? And then Legos is another noun. So each word in that sentence is doing a job. Now, what's this have to do with you? Well, when you write, if you have words that are out of place or you have the wrong words, um, you know, the wrong part of speech in that example, it's going to confuse your reader. And so we might look at a sentence and we're like, well, it's just, it's too long. It's a run, it's a run on sentence. Run on sentence. The problem with the run on sentence isn't that it's long. It's that it's broken down in its structure. And it got long and started to mess up with how the words work together. That's the actual problem. So understanding something like grammar helps you to understand, okay, why am I having a problem with this sentence? And then you can go back to what each job does and you can figure out how do I fix it so that we have a working subject predicate. All right. So other things that are part of standard written English are punctuation. Punctuation isn't something that we have to worry about in spoken English because you don't see it. It's just sounds that we make. Punctuation is a completely visual thing. So there are visual cues that tell the reader how words kind of relate to each other. So you have something like a comma, which is going to separate clauses and words in a list. You have quote. Uh, quotation marks, which show you where a quote begins and ends. A period shows you where the sentence ends. A question mark or an exclamation point shows you where the sentence ends and adds emotion or inflection. But they're all visual. 
they're things that you might pick up on when you hear someone speaking English, but they're things we have to write down. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't know something is a question if there's no question mark. You wouldn't know that someone is excited unless there's an exclamation point. You wouldn't know something's a quote unless there's a quotation mark. Does that make sense? So punctuation, they're very important visual clues. So grammar, we've put our words in order and we've chose the right kind of words so it makes sense. And then we add this layer of punctuation on top so that we understand how these words relate to each other. And as part of that, we also have spelling. Now spelling is, uh, is also a visual thing. It's not something that shows itself when you, when you speak because you can't tell what letters I'm using because there are no letters, it's just sounds, right? Um, but spelling is, again, a visual thing. Now, why is spelling important? Well, it helps the reader to know which word you mean. If you put the wrong letters or you misspell something, it's gonna cause confusion and we don't write something to confuse people. So that's why it's important to use the correct spelling. Now, this is a relatively new concept in the history of the world. It was like in the 1700s that we, in England, they decided, you know what, maybe we should, we should nail down how to spell specific words because you go earlier than that and they weren't always consistent. They kind of bounced around a little bit. Um, even now you look across the world, different places that speak English, they may not spell it the same way and that's fine. That's okay. But that's the way that it is. So you feel like you understand how English works. I know I went through this really fast, but these are the building blocks of the English language. We have our words that we use. Now, the way that we figure out the order of those words or which words we should use, that's grammar. Grammar kind of explains that concept. Um, and then we talked about some of that. We talked about parts of speech. We talked about the, the building blocks for a sentence, the subject, the predicate and complete thought. On top of that, we have punctuation, which helps us to understand how to read. Um, and so it's important as a writer to put that in to guide your reader. And along with that, spelling. Spelling helps the reader to know which, which words you meant to use. And you put it all together and they're tools to help communicate an idea that's in your head to your reader, where whether you're physically writing it out or you're typing it, you're texting it. That's how English works. So you, as a, uh, as a writer, as a reader, you can understand these concepts and build off of them. And then you can have mastery for how you communicate so that when you talk, people can understand. When you write, they can know what you're talking about and we can avoid confusion. So that's it. Thank you for, uh, for checking out this video. If you like videos like this, please uh, like and subscribe. Maybe share it with someone that you think it would help. But uh, I'm Dr. Jacob Larson. This has been Read, Write, Insight, and I will see you in the next video.